Okay, so, so I'm gonna wait a second so people are connected. And now it should be working. So hello, thank you so much everybody for joining us today. Um, we are very happy to have you again this month. And today uh, we have a very special persons uh, joining us to do the conference. Uh, Robert Pruna, he is a resident in uh, Barcelona. He's right now doing a rotation in Sudan, but he's from Barcelona. And Eduard Quintana, also from Barcelona, is going to be supporting him as well. And we have the uh, special uh, participation of Dr. Schaff. He's going to be the moderator of the event. So yeah, the word is yours. And please, let's go. Let's start. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I, can I start then? You can start, yes. Oh, thank you. So welcome to everyone. Thanks uh, to Dr. Mateo Padres for the introduction and to the outstanding and growing organization that, that is LACES for the opportunity to present this front round. Dr. Quintana and I will present three cases of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy with different levels of complexity and different approaches that may lead us to an interesting discussion after each case. As Dr. Quadra said, I am a third year resident in the Department of Cardiac Surgery in Hospital Clinic of Barcelona. But right now I am in Khartoum, in Sudan, Africa, in the Salam Center for Cardiac Surgery. It's an hospital that the Italian NGO emergency managed. And I'm here during a, a month uh, mission. So if anyone is interested about uh, this project and what the they are doing here, uh, they can speak to me later or they can go lead direct to the official webpage. So I hope that my connection goes well during the whole time. <laughs> After this, let's uh, go directly to the, free, to the first case. It's a 48 year old male with a past uh, medical, with no medical history, sorry, that presented a functional class three, a family history of sudden cardiac death. His father died at 35 uh, year old. So the primary physician discovered a systolic murmur. And after that, he referred to a cardiologist. The ICG had a LV hypertrophic signs and the echo had severe LVOT obstruction. So the diagnosis was hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Was a start on beta blocks, per, but despite this optimal uh, medical treatment, his symptoms uh, remain. And so it, uh, he was referred for a surgical evaluation. In this case, uh, 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 the echocardiography shows a symmetrical septal hypertrophy and a normal LV systolic function with a maximal septal thickness of 25 millimeters. The severe mitral reconstitution was present due to systolic anterior motion and the parton associated. So the regurgitant jet was directed to the posterior wall, as we can see in these images uh, also. The preoperative cardiac magnetic resonance shows severe septal hypertrophy with mid ventricular uh, component and a small LV cavity too. So uh, let's do a little introduction first. Uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the most common inherited cardiomyopathy with an autosomal dominant transmission. The prevalence in general population is uh, 0.2%. It's important to say that all those patients affected with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. One, one third has no obstruction at all. One third has obstruction at provocation and the other one third has obstruction even at rest. Uh, we, can, we want to show another landmark paper from Mayo Clinic Group where um, we can see that obstruction in these hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients is associated with worse outcomes. So if we now talk about the indications, as we can see in the 2020 American guidelines, patients with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy who remain, who remain severely symptomatic despite this optical medical treatment, uh, septal reduction therapy at experienced centers is uh, recommended. So um, septal reduction therapy in general is reserved for these patients with an obstructive uh, gradient of 50 or higher 
and whose symptoms are not relieved with medical optimal treatment and are in a high functional class, three or four. In our case, after the heart team agreement, the patient uh, was scheduled to go to the OT for a septal myopathy. So uh, with this paper of our moderator, Dr. Hazel Schaff, uh, we will explain briefly the isoparatic technique of transaortic extended, extended septal myectomy as proposed in the Mayo group. After a standard uh, median sternotomy, cardiopulmonary bypass is established with an ascending aortic cannula and a single venous atrial cannula. The paralyzing cold blood cardioplegia is administered anticipatively and with a higher dose than usual. And then an oblique aortotomy is performed. After that, a, a pump sucker is placed across the aortic annulus to retract the anterior medial leaflet and the papillary muscles posteriorly away for, from the ventricular septum. With a standard number 10 scalpel blade, is used for doing an incision in the septum that begins just to the right of the nadir of the right aortic sinus. This initial incision is made up and then leftward uh, over the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve towards this uh, left trigon. The septal excision is then deepened and lengthened towards the apex of the heart. To complete the left ventricular septal myectomy, uh, it extends from the subaortic level, as we say, to the midventricular level, opposite to the base of the anter anterior papillary muscles. If needed, a sponge stick is used to depress the right ventricle and rotate the septum posteriorly to bring the distal septum closer. In general, one can visualize the papillar muscles and the cordae while looking through the aortic root after this myectomy has been completed. So um, in these uh, images, uh, we can see that the inspection of the subalvular apparatus for any mitral uh, anormalities should be performed. In these images, uh, uh, as I, I was saying, there are examples of abnormal cordae, cordae and subalvular attachment. In our case, uh, we did a transaortic extendal septal myectomy, and in the postoperative uh, transophageal echocardiography, we can see that there is no obstruction and an adequate resection of this hypertrophic uh, interventricular septum. In the Doppler image, we can assess the resolution of the mitral valve preoccupation with no sound. Again, a comparison in the left, uh, the preoperative Doppler, and in the right, the postoperative echocardiography. With uh, with no with no MR. In this video, we want to show another maneuver to assess if there is any LVOT gradient before and after this septal myectomy, directly using the aortic root to assess arterial blood pressure and another needle directly in the left ventricle through the right ventricle and the interventricular septum. The pressure of the left ventricle and in the aorta are recorded simultaneously. So a peak-to-peak -peak gradient is calculated by the subtraction of the aortic pressure from LV in systole. With forceps, we can also gently stimulation to cause a premature ventricular contraction, a PVC, that can be done to assess the gradient under provocation. As we can see in the images, um, uh, this gradient after this PVC maneuver is uh, uh, greater. We can see now how is this maneuver. So in our case, uh, in this video, we can see this interoperative uh, direct measurement of this LVOT gradient before doing the septal myectomy. In this case, the, LVO, the LV systolic pressure is a red line over the aortic pressure. Without the stimulation, we have a, at least a 45 millimeter of mercury gradient. So the postoperative, um, uh, it, this is the postoperative video that we can assess the result after the septal myectomy. In this video, the left ventricle pressure is the yellow line and the aortic pressure is the red line. Note that in this case, there is no gradient, neither at rest or after this provocation maneuver uh, uh, after this uh, premature ventricular contraction. This direct maneuver is a useful maneuver. Uh, if there is any doubt of echocardiographic assessment of the gradient uh, after this septal myectomy. So after that, the patient was discharged on postoperative day five without major complications and a complete resolution of the symptoms was achieved at the early and at the late follow-up. 
And after this, uh, let's start with the first discussion after this case. As uh, uh, Dr. Cuadras has explained, we can do a briefly discussion after, after each one. So you have the word. Should I start out? Is that the way? For example, yes, yes, Mr. Sure, would be happy to. Listen, that was a terrific presentation, Robert. I, I don't have much to add to the <laughs> the, uh, the surgical approach there. I, I would just point out a, a couple of things. It's sure. almost every presentation on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy starts out with a frequency of one in 500. But I just point out that that's one in 500 patients who have the phenotype. And now that we have genetic testing, and if you think about patients who are gene positive, but phenotype negative, the frequency of this disease may be much more, and it may be as high as one in every 200 patients. So I think it's something for surgeons to pay attention to because this is a very, very common uh, disease. Now, I, I saw that you had the, the echo on this patient preoperatively. It was a very nice echo, and then you moved to the MRI. What, what extra information did you get from the cardiac MR? And we can assess also if there is any fibrotic uh, myocardial and that led uh, after uh, some um, major risk of uh, fibrillation. We can uh, let's search this MRI. Well, I it's just a point for the other for the other surgeons and for the residents uh, to always think about what you need as a surgeon and. In, in most cases, what we need as a surgeon is a good transthoracic echocardiogram. Now, sometimes we can't get all the information we need, but this was a, a very nice echocardiogram, which showed subaortic obstruction of the typical type uh, with systolic anterior motion. We wouldn't necessarily get a CMR to help with surgery, although we would do it for the reasons that you just explained. Now, this patient already had an ICD in, so you know, you're not getting it for risk assessment and deciding whether to do an ICD. You're, but, but the question does come up commonly in conferences such as this one about what, what tests do you need? Well, the, the two most important tests, I think in my practice, the two most important tests are the transthoracic echocardiogram and occasionally a treadmill exercise test. We can, and we can talk about that um, a little bit later. Now. You mentioned that, that this patient had a posteriorly directed jet. Maybe you could get that back up there, Robert. Yes, sure. And the, the posteriorly directed jet is, uh, is typical of patients with what we call SAM-mediated mitral regurgitation. So if you have SAM and you have mitral regurgitation that's posteriorly directed, almost always, uh, you can get rid of it with an adequate myectomy. Now, if you have central regurgitation, this is one that's a little controversial because there are some people that believe that central regurgitation is due to intrinsic mitral valve disease. But we found that this jet direction business, it's, it's very helpful um, in terms of if you have it, you're likely to have SAM-mediated MR. If you have central regurgitation without posteriorly directed uh, uh, jet, you, that still can be SAM mediated. So if, if you didn't have it and you just had central mitral regurgitation without leaflet prolapse, there's a good chance that you could get rid of this mitral regurgitation after the myectomy. So if you didn't have what you see here, but you didn't have leaflet prolapse, we would still do the myectomy and then come off bypass and see if that got rid of the MR before doing anything directly to the mitral valve. Does anyone have any questions about the surgical approach or the... Yeah, Dr. Schaff, I have a question maybe for the presenters or for you. As Robert mentioned, the indication according to the guidelines to uh, operate this patient is only if they are not responding to medical therapy. Do you think this recommendation is maybe too conservative and like too late? Do you think it's maybe proper to operate these patients 
er, earlier in the uh, development of the disease or the evolving evolution of the disease? Well, it's a great it's a great question, and actually, I I think if you look at the most current guidelines and look at them carefully, there's a statement in there that patients should be informed of the of the possible benefit of septal myectomy and that some patients may choose to have that or that it's not inappropriate to go ahead with surgery even before exhausting medical therapy. And I'll be happy to try to get that up or somebody could get the guidelines up and look at the surgical indications, but we changed it for just the reason that you mentioned, Edward. Any other? But I, and it's, a, it's an interesting point about how, to what extent do you persist with medical treatment? I don't know how, what the attitude of the cardiologist is at, at your center, but our cardiologist will almost always talk to the patient about the availability of septal reduction therapy, even at the time that they're adjusting the medicine so the patients can, can make that decision. And, and many patients will say, well, listen, I'd rather go forward with surgery rather than, than fooling around with more medicines. But that's an individual, uh, that's an individual patient-centered approach. Any other questions about the case? Hi, Dr. Schaff, how are you? This is Victor Dayan. It's very nice to meet, to see you again. Nice to talk to you. Thank you for, for your presence today. This is very important for us. Sure. So I have a question because this is regarding a, a, a similar patient I had a, a couple of weeks ago. This was a patient with a hypertroph a septal myex, septal hypertrophy, and he had like a gradient of 100 with high dose of beta blockers, and he was mild symptomatic, but he had a very high uh, how do you call it? Pro, uh, pro BMP, the brain naturetic factor. So what's the role of a pursuing surgery in a patient who is mild symptomatic? What importance do you give to brain naturetic factor uh, since it has given us a, a little bit of importance for aortic valve uh, uh, pathology, how important it is for a septal hypertrophy you know, in order to guide treatment? We don't routinely get BNPs, but I'll tell you what we would do with your patient. And that's, that's exactly the kind of patient that we would put on a treadmill and get a functional study. Because many of these patients, uh, patients with obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have some very peculiar presentations. Many times their symptoms will come on so gradually and insidiously, it's like mitral stenosis that patients will be very disabled, even though when you ask them what they can do, they say, oh, I do everything I wanna do in life. And I'll tell you a story. This is a great story I tell it to some patients. I had a young woman, young, when she wasn't that young, she was in her forties. And I said, you know, I introduced myself. I said, I'm, I'm here to see you uh, about the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. How limited are you? And she said, oh, I'm not limited at all. And I thought, my God, I'm in the wrong room. I've got the wrong patient. Uh, she said, uh, I walked over here from the hotel. Uh, no problems. I said, really? The hotel's about five blocks away from the Mayo Clinic building. She said, yeah, I only stopped three times. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I usually stop when I walk. I said, well, I don't usually stop when I walk. She said, oh, yeah, I stop when I walk. I said, do you take care of your house? And she said, yeah, no problem. I just sit down after I clean a room. So she cleans a room and sits down and rests, cleans room. So, so people become accustomed to their limitation. And I would, I would be willing to wager that your patient with a gradient of 100 and a high BNP, if you put them on a treadmill test, their functional aerobic capacity would be 50% of normal. So I think it's very helpful in these patients who are a little cagey about describing their symptoms to do a formal exercise test. And it gives you something to put in front of the patient to say, look, you're only doing 50% of what you ought to be able to do. You may feel like you're okay, but you would feel much, much better if you had the gradient relief. 
Great, thanks. Does anyone else have any uh, any questions? So, if not, we can proceed to the second case. Sure. Okay. So, um, this second case that we present is a 58 year old male with past medical history of hypertension and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who presented uh, with advanced heart failure symptoms and recurrent syncope that was uh, with appropriate medical treatment and failed to control the symptoms. So, here we, are, here we have the echocardiographic preoperative echocardiography that uh, shows severe LV hypertrophy with LV of T obstruction, 70 at rest, 70 at rest and more than 100 uh, under provocation. Additionally, both anterior and posterior middle leaflets were elongated, contributing to this uh, systolic anterior motion, the SAM, and uh, uh, causing a severe mitral regurgitation. Uh, again, this uh, regurgitant jet was directly posteriorly. So, uh, again, this uh, preoperative uh, cardiac magnetic resonance. We can also assess this asymmetric hypertrophy with a maximal septal thickness of 22 millimeters, also a presence of fibrosis. In general, we use this CT scan or structural CT, uh, sorry, this uh, MR, RMI or structural CT scans to tailor the plan of the day operation. In this case, uh, what we want to show is uh, some short videos uh, that shows not only the septal myectomy, also different procedures that can be done in the, the LVOT. So let's start with the first one. Uh, in this case, with a malleable spatula, uh, was used to redact this right coronary leaflet and the upper part of the septum, then allows appropriate exposure to the left ventricular optal tract and the subvalvular uh, mitral apparatus. The first incision uh, was approximately three millimeters below the navid of this right coronary cusp. With this initial incision, allows the grasping the septum and bringing it towards the surgeon. With a number plate, the incision was extended leftwards to the left trigon. It's important not to lose this initial plane, as it helps end block resection of this uh, first uh, septal specimen. Instances an angle halfel provides a better reach. Uh, a pump sucker was used at times to separate the mitral valve from the septum in order to create a space while protecting the mitral valve apparatus. The resection was tailored to leave a residual septal thickness of at least one centimeter to prevent this hydrogenic ventricular septal defect. After this uh, first myocardial piece was resected, additional incisions and resections were carried out to distally and uh, to the left ventricle cavity to avoid the displacement obstruction point and a residual obstruction. Uh, with this, uh, care must be taken to avoid overstretching of these resected regions in order to avoid, uh, as I said, these hydrogenic septal defects. The surface of these uh, areas were maintained as smooth as possible to avoid embolization of these uh, muscular fragments. So uh, after this, we find a, a fibrotic membrane. So we're going to show again a little video. Uh, this subaortic membrane and fibrotic tissue were resected by peeling this scar tissue bluntly from the endocardial surface. This tissue led the, the blockage of the right trigon. So it was resected to increase the anterior middle leaflet excursion more posteriorly to further prevent the systolic anterior motion. In particular, uh, in this case, as we can see, after this uh, resection, uh, we extend it also towards the right side, uh, the, the myectum, but always under the conduction system. After this, we can show another uh, procedure that can be done in, in the LVOT beyond this uh, septal myectum. Um, we're going to show a video of the assessment of this mitral valve. This anterior middle leaflet, as I said in the echocardiography, was found to be elongated. 
this excessive issue of a central aspect of the anterior leaflet uh, was still judged to potential invade this uh, left ventricular outflow tract. So therefore, in order to move the coaptation point posteriorly and avoid uh, residual SAM, um, uh, the central anterior leaflet component was uh, horizontally placated with 4-0 uh, polypropylene uh, sutures. After this, uh, an assessment of the mitral valve was underdone. So another maneuver that we can do is uh, this uh, examination of the subvalvular apparatus. It was carried to assess the presence of abnormal secondary cords that could tether the mitral valve anteriorly. Such secondary cords were divided and resected where supportive primary cords at the free edge were sufficient. As explained in this Ferratis article, cutting the selected abnormal cord eye in combination with the septal myectomy moves the uh, mitral valve apparatus and the leaflet coaptation point away from the outflow tract to a more posterior and normal position in the left ventricular cavity. So uh, increasing the outflow tract size and decreasing the mitral valve tenting area. After this, the postoperative echocardiography show an appropriate septal resection with the resolution of left ventricular outflow tract. No residual obstruction was addressed or under provocation. Again, the postoperative cardiac magnetic resonance can be assessed, the severe asymmetric uh, hypertrophy, but with no obstruction in the LVOT in basal conditions in this case. So the outcomes of this patient was discharged on postoperative day four without complications, and a complete resolution of the symptoms was achieved uh, in the early and in the late in the late follow-up. We can start now the, the second discussion. Uh, in this case, we, we have shown a resolution of the obstructions, but in some patients requires an LVOT intervention beyond uh, this uh, extended septal myectomy. So it's your turn now. Well, that's, it, that's another great case and it brings up lots of points about how you assess and approach patients that are a little more complicated. I, I would just ask the other surgeons who are available, how many people use these adjunctive procedures such as leaflet plication or cordial cutting? Edward, what's your uh, practice? Yes, we brought this case because we, we would stimulate some debate here. Uh, well, I would say co secondary cordial uh, cutting has become more and more frequent in our practice. I didn't do it at all when, when I started, when I came back from, from training with you. And uh, I wonder whether it, it, it really helps with uh, when you provocate uh, further patients with, uh, with uh, the vitamin or when they are under stress. Uh, I don't have a, a real good answer whether this is strictly necessary for the vast majority of patients. But uh, in, some, in some patients, I have to admit that uh, I have found it uh, useful to fully relieve obstruction uh, after two rounds of uh, cardiopulmonary bypass if I weren't unable to relieve obstruction. So these are tools that you have, you have to maybe keep in mind that can be helpful, especially in patients that have uh, less thickened uh, septums. Maybe that case we could have extended uh, further the resection, I think, also. And uh, I wonder whether this would uh, have been enough also without touching that, that many things in the, in the LVOT. But uh, certainly that, that, that are things that can be useful sometimes. Victor, what's your practice? Yes, we have very few cases because we are a, a small country and, and uh, each institution has few cases of this. But what I have noticed uh, in, in the few cases that we have is that generally, these patients with a hypertrophy obstructive, idiopathic hypertrophy obstructive, uh, they have additional or they have more than normal secondary cords in the anterior mitral valve and even a very um, thick um, papillary muscles 
that sometimes these issues are the ones that, as a matter of fact, are generating the abstraction. And I remember one case in which we had to generate to, to cut off these secondary chords, not so much because the, the mitral valve was getting into the, the, the LVO tract, but because the secondary cords were so thick that they were generating this obstruction. But our experience is, is very, very scant. Are there any other surgeons who have experience with the cordal cutting or leaflet plication? I, anyone else wants to pick up? You know, we, we've done this, we've done the cordal cutting in a few cases, but I, I find it very difficult to know how much good that that, um, that, that does. And I'll, I'll tell another story. One time I was on a panel and the, the, the discussion on this panel was adjunctive procedures on the mitral valve. And on one side, a surgeon from New York was talking about plicating the mitral valve as you did in this case to shorten the cords. Another surgeon was talking about leaflet patching to elongate the anterior leaflet. And it seemed to me that we were squarely in the middle. We didn't do either one uh, because it's our view that while leaflets may be elongated, to us that means you need to make the, the septal myectomy a little longer. Um, now it, it is in some cases very difficult to do that because of exposure or, or another reason. And, and there have been some cases where we've actually done a transapical distal septal resection because of residual obstruction, but we don't do much to the, it's been our practice not to do much to the, to the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, but it's something that everybody should know about. If you get into a situation where you come off bypass and you have residual obstruction to look at that echo carefully and see where the obstruction is and decide whether you're gonna to get to it by plicating the valve or by doing more myectomy through the aorta or more myectomy uh, through the apex. Could you go back to your, your very first intraoperative video? I just want to make one point. Yes. If you could get that up. And I, I'm going to tell you uh, all the complications that I've had, and I'll tell you how I avoided one of them. One of the complications of, of septal myectomy is injury to the aortic valve. And you have to be careful when you're passing instruments through the aortic valve to do the myectomy. And one of the things when I first started doing myectomies, the surgeons here used a malleable retractor. And if you use a malleable retractor that's too wide, and that one is not, maybe not too wide, but it's pretty wide. If you're not careful and your assistant pulls too hard on the right coronary cusp, you can injure that. So be very careful. And if you do use a malleable, I would advise you to use a narrow one so that you don't, less, less chance of, of injury to that right cusp. Um, you know, this is an interesting patient because there are a few patients where it is, it's difficult to know whether what you see on the septum is a contact lesion or a true fibrous membrane. And there may be some overlap between membranous subaortic stenosis and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with an endocardial contact lesion. Probably not so important in terms of what you do at the time of surgery because you take it out and you do a myectomy. But if it's true membranous subaortic stenosis, and this may be because you see that membrane goes around, it goes to the right. Sometimes the membrane will end up on the anterior leaf of the mitral valve. I don't some of you all may be congenital surgeons as well. And when you, when you do a case, a, a child who has membranous subaortic stenosis, there's just a circuitrix of the valve that you can uh, remove and it goes on the septum, goes on the anterior leaf of the mitral valve. Now, the only reason it's important to differentiate that is that the prognosis is quite different. If, if, if your patient has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and I don't know that this patient has it, this patient has dynamic outflow tract obstruction, you don't know whether the underlying cause is hypertension or the underlying cause is membranous subaortic stenosis. But the point is, if you have membranous subaortic stenosis of the congenital variety, not hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, 
the chance of recurrence of obstruction is about 30% over 10 years. It's interesting with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we, we just never see recurrent hypertrophy and obstruction. So the congenital subaortic stenosis that's membranous, it's kind of a nice operation. It's nice and clean. Most of the patients are young. You do a membranectomy, you do a myectomy and everything looks great. That's, in some cases, it's e even easier. If the aorta is large enough, it's even easier than a myectomy uh, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But those patients really have quite a high risk of having recurrent obstruction where patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy do. Dr. Schaff? Yes, go ahead. No, sorry, please go ahead. I, I have one question. You have a very wide experience with this kind of patient. So I wanted to ask you maybe for people with less experience and volume of these patients, you have like, a, let's say, one trick to evaluate when you are doing the procedure, how to visually recognize how much tissue, tissue is enough, like you are not cutting too much or, or not enough because you are always scared about like maybe taking too, like a way too big bite. So do you have any surgical trick to evaluate how much is enough or, or maybe it is a little bit more still needed? Well, I, what we try to teach our residents is that the key to this operation is not the depth of the myectomy, it's the length of the myectomy. Now the depth of the myectomy, if you look at a number 10 blade, that 10 blade, the width of a 10 blade is eight millimeters. So if you're, if you put the 10 blade inside and cut up on the septum, as soon as that 10 blade disappears, you've gone eight millimeters. You don't know, you don't need to go more deeply. Then you turn leftward and you go over to the anterior leaf of the mitral valve. Now, if you take out more muscle, don't take out more muscle in the same spot. You need to take out muscle distal, just as you showed, just as was shown on that that first case of Edwards where you, you rotate the heart posteriorly and you take out more muscle distal to your previous site of excision. And I think where surgeons get in trouble is they'll do a myectomy. Maybe they're a little concerned about taking too much, come off bypass and they're still a gradient. Then they go back on and they do a myectomy in the same spot and do take out more muscle in the same spot. When you do that, not only do you not relieve the gradient but your risk of VSD. Does that make sense? To me, that's the most important technical point. Absolutely, yeah, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions now about, uh, about this patient? You know, it's, the other thing that's interesting is that we as surgeons are treating dynamic outflow tract obstruction. Most of these patients will have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Some of them will have genetic gene positive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In, in our experience, it doesn't really matter whether you're gene positive for any of the different uh, variants. The prognosis is the same. Some of the patients will just have longstanding hypertension and kind of a sigmoid septum with angulation that leads to a dynamic outflow tract obstruction, but those patients do just as well with relief of the obstruction as, uh, in, a, in addition. So it's a very, you know, it's as you get, as you encounter older patients, they may have the physiology, but not have the same underlying pathology. They, they can have just systemic hypertension as the cause for septal hypertrophy. All right. Okay. Yes, yes. I, I would have a, a question, Dr. Schaff, uh, mainly because the objective of, of these rounds is especially for residents and people who are in their first years of, of cardiac surgery. Uh, what would be the most common complications that you have faced and your recommended way to solve it? Sure. Well, I've had probably every complication that there can be. Um, Let's start with the one that people are the most concerned about. And that is, well, I'd say heart block and VSD are the ones that, that people think about most often. Now, if you do the operation the way that was, that was illustrated in that very first case, 
and you start your incision just to the right of the nadir of the right aortic sinus, not way to the right, but just a bit to the right, and then carry the area of excision leftward, you will, you will get a, a left bundle branch block in about 30% of the patients. And if the chance of getting complete heart block, if the patient comes into surgery with normal AV conduction, the chance of getting complete heart block with the operation that you showed on that first, in that first case is about 1%. Now, the, the, the re, if you do more excision down to the right, there's a little higher instance of heart block. And if the patient comes to surgery with a right bundle branch block, then the chance of a heart block is about 30%. So recognize that when you do this operation, you give a left bundle in about 30% of patients. And if they had a right bundle before, either because of alcohol septal ablation or just intrinsic conduction disease, there is a substantial risk of a, of a, uh, of a pacemaker. One of the things, that's a reason I think it's important to, to talk to cardiologists who are considering alcohol ablation, and we can talk about that as well. But, you know, the, some people say, well, the strategy ought to be, well, let's do alcohol ablation. If that doesn't work, we can do surgery. And the disadvantage with that approach is if you give a young patient a right bundle with alcohol ablation, and then you send them to me, and I give them a left bundle with surgery, then, they have, then they're 40 years old and they have a pacemaker. And you can say, well, so what? I mean, a pacemaker. Well, there are complications, long-term complications with pacemakers. And we found in our myectomy experience that survival after myectomy is lower in patients that have had pacemakers put in compared to those that have normal AV conduction. So, you know, the, avoiding a pacemaker is, I think, important, especially for, for, for younger patients. Now, you, you avoid the VSD by doing the operation the way that I discussed it, but if you get a VSD, then what I, what I suggest doing is going back on bypass and repairing it through the right ventricle. Don't, don't try to repair it through the aorta. Even if you feel like you can see it, if the muscle's too friable and you'll have a much better chance of repairing it through the right ventricle plus, it's very easily exposed. The VSD you get with a myectomy is high in the septum, just beneath, it's in the outflow tract. And it's very easy to see. It's not down in the cords of the tricuspid valve like a congenital VSD. And we, we almost always patch them uh, and approach them through the right, through the right ventricle. Um, the other problem is if you, carry the myectomy too far to the left and take out too much muscle near the free wall, it is possible to get a free wall rupture. I've seen that once and that uh, not a very happy situation either. But that really only occurs in elderly patients with, with, very, with relatively asymmetric hypertrophy and, and almost normal LV lateral walls and you, you avoid taking out muscle in those patients. So that's that's VSD and and uh, VSDs and and uh, pacemakers. Now, what we talked about, what what is not uncommon, but is not talked about very often, is this injury to the aortic valve or injury to the mitral valve. If, if we use that, we use the cardiotomy sucker to depress the anterior leaf of the mitral valve and keep it away from the area of excision. And if you do enough of these, you're going to either cut a cord or stretch the aortic valve. And we always try to repair the valves rather than replace them. So if you get a little rent in an aortic valve, then we, we, we repair that with a fine suture and sometimes placate the commissures. If we injure the, the mitral valve, then we will repair the valve and don't default to valve replacement, or at least we think it's important not to default to valve replacement. Uh, and those are, I think, the main ones, although I suspect I've had other complications. Okay, so if anyone has any question, I will proceed with the third case. This third case is a 70-year-old woman that presented advanced heart failure symptoms 
with worsening of his uh, functional class in the last six months. The past medical history was hypertension, dyslipidemia, long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, chronic renal failure, and this hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Again, the appropriate medical treatment failed to control symptoms. So in this case, uh, when we have uh, established heart failure symptoms, surgery can address them more solutions in addition to fix this LVOT obstruction. We can perform arterial fibrillation uh, ablation surgery. Uh, also, we can act directly to the mitral valve, or we can enlarge the LV cavity and gain the diastolic function. So we have more momentarium than other non-surgical septal resection therapies or other um, pharma um, solutions to these um, heart failure symptoms in uh, HOCOM. So here's the preoperative echocardiography. And we can see a severe long segment hypertrophy of the left ventricle, collapse in the mitoventricular level with a significant gradient at rest of 60. Um, the maximal septal thickness was 30 millimeters and the middle valve uh, was also, sorry that I passed the image. Uh, as I say, in the mitral valve, uh, we can assess also the severe calcification of the posterior leaflet and also the annulus. Uh, was the, also, this patient had mitral regurgitation that was uh, moderate at rest and severe tricuspidation with severe pulmonary hypertension. In the preoperative, sorry, in the preoperative uh, magnetic resonance, we can assess uh, better this severe lung segment hypertrophy and note again the reduced LV cavity. The systolic function was preserved and also we had uh, fibrosis in this, uh, in this patient. So the interventions that we, we advocate in this case, we perform a combined approach for this extended septal myectomy using a transaortic and also a transapical uh, approach. Uh, also with the comorbidities that that patient had, uh, we did a bi-arterial maze, a left appendage closure, and a tricuspid valve annuloplast. With this video, uh, after the extended septal myectomy uh, through the aorta, we proceed to perform a secondary approach. The transapical myectomy has been proposed for uh, the treatment of uh, severely symptomatic patients with apical and midventricular or long segment obstruction through an incision that it's made in the apex uh, of, the left, of the left ventricle that it's lateral of the left uh, anterior descending coronary artery. This uh, is excision of the uh, ventricular muscle and the apex and uh, midventricular level is performed uh, with the objective of increasing this uh, left ventricle and diastolic volume and improving uh, the LV compliance. Removing this excess of muscle of the thickness septum and the free wall, um, uh, we, this muscle resection was extended towards the base of the ventricle, joining the transaortic myectomy that was done uh, through the aorta previously. As we can see, we can enlarge this uh, left ventricle and we try to reach the, the septal myectomy done through, through the transaortic approach. So the postoperative echocardiography show uh, a more enlarged LV cavity. And in the postoperative uh, uh, resonance, we can, we can see that there is uh, no obstruction after this combined approach. 
and uh, there is a, also the resolution of the uh, mitral uh, valve regurgitation. Note that there are there is uh, um, atrial uh, contraction in this case. Here we can see a comparative uh, imaging of the in the left uh, the uh, preoperative imaging, and here in the right the postoperative uh, image. This patient was discharged on postoperative day uh, 18 without major complications. And the follow up after five years in outpatient clinic was a complete resolution of the symptoms with sinus riding and even a normalization of the renal olfaction. So, from here, we're going to say some take home messages and then uh, uh, end with the last discussion. So, septal myectomy is a low risk intervention and remains the first septal reduction therapeutic option. Usually an appropriate myectomy relieves uh, LV obstruction, LVOT obstruction, and secondary mitral regurgitation. For the vast majority of patients, uh, is a return to a normal lifestyle and increase the survival. Uh, tailored interventions beyond the septal resection in certain patients may be useful to get an optimal hemodynamic result and a combined approaches can solve complex long segment uh, HOCOM cases. And as we can see in this uh, last case, an increased age and a need for multiple concomitant procedures is not a contraindication for this surgery. So dedicate multidisciplinary programs are necessary to, to achieve excellence in this, in this field. And thank you very much for your attention and we can go to the uh, last discussion. Thank you, Robert. That, that's a terrific case. Um, you did this one, Edward? Yes, that was a few years ago already. Five years, I think, Robert, you said? Five years ago? Yes. yes. So early in my practice, I would say. <laughs> well, listen, it's fantastic, and I'm glad that you... You know, if you show that post-op and the pre-op MR, you ought to get that in front of all the cardiologists um, because it shows what surgery can do. And I think nowadays, as opposed to five or 10 years ago, we can approach many more patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy than we could before when all we were doing was the subaortic myectomy and relieving outflow tract obstruction. When you go back to the pre-op, the other pre-op studies, Robert, can you go backwards just another time? Yes, the echocardiography. Yeah. We, when we first started doing this, that's a good one there. That, yeah. Sorry. When we I... first started doing apical myectomies, we did the operation in patients. Yeah, this is a good one right here. We did it in this patients. Is the pre had, this one right here. Leave it, leave that, just let that one yeah. continue to go. Oops, you changed it too fast. It, it's, the, it's the same that goes on. No. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So when we first started doing this operation, we did it in patients with, who had apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where there was really no apex that contracted at all. And we did it to enlarge the ventricle. But once you do that operation a few times and you see from the apex what you can get to from the apex, then you realize that, it's, that that approach is useful for these long segment obstructions. And it's also useful for a case like this. And what we would, we would call a case like this, not only long segment obstruction, but systolic obliteration. You have complete systolic obliteration. And these patients that have that, if they have obstruction, you need to deal with that. But we've had patients that had non-obstructive diastolic heart failure from this systolic obliteration. And we offer surgery to those patients as well as to patients that have diastolic heart failure due to apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because you can enlarge the ventricle just as you've done in this case. It looked terrific. I mean, you've increased the stroke volume and this patient's cardiac output is going to be much better. So I think it's a, it's, it's a, this case is a great illustration of what can be, of what can be done through the apex. We use it for long segment septal hypertrophy. We use it for systolic cavity obliteration we use it for patients who have uh, apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and diastolic heart failure. 
And then there's some patients that will have it, these apical pouches. I don't know. Have you done many of those, you guys? Anybody yeah. seen the apical pouches? Some here and there, yes. The apical pouches are interesting. They come up often in patients that have midventricular obstruction and they'll get ischemia distally, subventricardial mm -hmm. ischemia. And the apical pouches, you can find clot, and, you, and many of them will have arrhythmias. We've operated on, many, or not many, but several patients that have had VT storm related to their apical pouch. So despite having a defibrillator put in, it's, the defibrillator is not very helpful if it's going off 10 times in a day. So anyway, I think the transapical approach is, is very useful, and I'm, I'm glad to see that, that you're using it there in Barcelona. That's terrific. Tell me what you did. What is a biatrial maze in your practice? Everybody it seems like everybody's maze operation is a little bit different. Tell me about yours. This one, in fact, we brought this case because we want to stimulate some discussion on different types of maze or ablation procedures, let's say. This one is uh, one done with alternative energies with uh, cryo on the left side. So the full pattern of lesions with uh, cryothermia. Uh, the box lesion, the lesion from the box to the left uh, atrial appendage, the ismus lesion and the ablation of the coronary sinus from the epicardial side. And then on the right side, uh, we do, uh, you know, cava to cava, uh, vertical atriotomy, and then from this one to the right atrial appendage. And then we do with cryo from the inside towards the, the, uh, the tricuspid uh, Annulus. So that's how we've been approaching these these cases, and I always tell them whether we should move to to the cat and so maze, but it seemed a bit too much to me for cases like this, which are usually older, yeah. frail sometimes. And I don't know what's your opinion on that. Uh, certainly, it would be more more efficient, but maybe more risky. Yeah, no, I agree. We're we're very selective whenever we do the uh, cut and so maze, and there's lots of different options and there's lots of different presentations now there'll be some patients that say well i you know i had atrial fibrillation one time and i went to the emergency room and it converted by the time they got me in the hospital so what do you do with that patient this patient this patient early in my practice i would do a pulmonary vein ablation left atrial appendix exclusion yeah. right now i would do a full biatrial lesion in all patients that have uh, you know, severely symptomatic AFib or uh, long-standing persistent or paroxysmal, very severe symptoms, that's what we would do now. That's what we, would, we, we agree with you on the long-standing persistent and that sort of thing. But what about a patient who's had two episodes in his sinus? Same, same, same. I think here we have also another expert that you know well, which is, I, I don't know whether Ovidio is still there. And uh, we know that the, the results of the, of the maze operation, what they are on the long term, and we, do the, we know that if we do a more extensive operation, we're more likely to get uh, uh, rid of atrial fibrillation in the long uh, run. So that's why we advocate for being more aggressive at the time of septal myectomy, because I don't think it really adds that much risk uh, to the operation. Well, I, I, I have no experience uh, working uh, with all these two procedures together, uh, but certainly the maze procedure uh, uh, made as a full biatrilation pattern, just like you did in this case. Uh, it, this is the way that I prefer always, always, in uh, non paroxysmal yet, always. The results, in my experience, uh, have been uh, up to 90% for uh, film of AF at five years for the walk, uh, always working as a full biatrilation pattern. I, I think this is the most important point in these cases. But I insist, I, I have no experience working with these two procedures uh, altogether. Also, one more, one more thing. I, I found sometimes that doing the left-sided uh, pulmonary veins, if I were to do only a pulmonary vein ablation in some of these hearts, it's almost impossible to me sometimes when they're really severely hypertrophied. It's very hard sometimes to enucleate the heart and go through the, at least I've had difficulties in some cases, which mm -hmm. I don't have if I go through the left atrium with a cryo. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think you, I think you're right. It's hard. It, it is sometimes hard to get a clamp around it and do 
you know, a pulmonary vein isolation from the out from the outside. So there's, if we look at our experience with ablation, it's very hard for us to tell a difference in the outcome of patients in terms of survival, whether they've had their AF treated by surgical ablation or not. But the problem with that is that everybody gets treated some way, either with drugs or with catheter ablations late. <clears throat> so it's, it's, it's a hard thing to prove in terms of the efficacy, but I think you're correct and saying that the more you do, the less likely recurrence is. And on the other hand, we see patients, about 20% of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy come to surgery, 20% will have a history of atrial fibrillation. But of that 20%, at least half of them have only had one or two episodes and are not in atrial fibrillation at the time of surgery. And I think it's still an open question about what is the best treatment for those patients? Certainly getting rid of the atrial appendage and doing something, whether it's pulmonary vein ablation or, or what you all do, which is a more complete face procedure is, is reasonable, but it's just hard to prove that that uh, improves their long-term survival. But anyway, it's, a, it's an interesting problem that we don't have solved. It, it brings up one other issue though, when you were talking about indications for surgery, in the guidelines, this, the most recent guidelines, if you look carefully, there's a caveat in there about what are the indications for surgery. And in, in there, in the guidelines, there's a caveat for if you're following a patient who has relatively few exertional symptoms, but you see mitral regurgitation and progressive left atrial enlargement, you should or could speak to the patient about the high risk of development of atrial fibrillation and the possibility that going ahead with surgery to relieve obstruction, SAM and MR might reduce that in the future, but that's actually in the guidelines. Atrial fibrillation is a big problem uh, for these patients. Dr. Schaff. Somebody's raising the hand. Uh, I don't see the name, but maybe he can unmute his or her uh, microphone and ask the question. Carlos. Oh, uh, hello, yeah. how are you? Dr. Mestres, yeah. Uh, everybody in, in uh, North and South America. Uh, I'm not sure if you, uh, uh, if you can see me, but anyway, if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Enough, uh, I'd like, first of all, to thank the opportunity given to us by Latin American society uh, to participate in this, uh, to learn in this, <clears throat> in this session. Second is a personal pleasure to see again after a while, uh, Dr. Schaff. Uh, uh, hello, also, how are you? And Very of good. course, yes, to, and uh, of course, to see <clears throat> my colleagues from, from Barcelona for obvious reasons. Uh, I think from the perspective of, uh, of the one who's learning like me, there are a couple of important things in this session. First of all, the intrinsic teaching value, uh, but a couple of more comments if I am allowed to. One, I would like to go back to the first intervention by Dr. Schaff when he was talking about pacemaker. Uh, and I think one of the problems we see at least in Europe is that because Holcomb or uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is mostly, uh, I would say, a cardiological disease in opposite uh, to what is happening in, in the US for, for, for years, uh, is more or less what happens with TAVI. So the people tend to neglect the um, importance of uh, pacemaker implantation because we create a second disease in someone who should not have one. And uh, a peripocidal complete heart block in in uh, alcohol ablation is at least 10 to 15%, if I'm not wrong, or even more. Uh, I cannot compare to surgery, and the patient will really have, uh, and many of them, they, they may even evolve towards more serious problems. So I think uh, we must not neglect the value that, that the problem that uh, pacemaker implantation uh, at any age or most of the diseases, and specifically in, in hypertrophic myopathy is a real problem and the patient will go uh, back home uh, after most of these uh, interventional procedures with a much higher risk of even implantation, especially because if I don't remember badly, uh, conduction abnormalities <clears throat> after septal ablation, uh, alcohol septal ablation are easily 
50, 60, or even 70 percent in terms of right bundle branch block. So I think that was one of, the, to me, one of the most important uh, points discussed uh, tonight in, in in Europe and in the evening in, in northern South America. Second, uh, the fact that uh, in any case, <clears throat> um, we, we, we cannot compare what happens in, <clears throat> in Europe on the other side of the Atlantic. And I think these rounds, they have an extremely uh, important value to, to create awareness and try to uh, implement those policies that uh, go towards uh, surgeries. I mean, whether the people like it or not, uh, a heart attack, cardiomyopathy is a surgical disease. We know that for 60 years, but uh, people like uh, Dr. Schaff and his colleagues and just a few other colleagues uh, uh, have shown that. Uh, Europe, and I would like to briefly go back to what uh, Dr. Schaff said, uh, is, is a very complicated area. <clears throat> and I think that most of the patients are really skewed towards a non-surgical approach. And uh, we, we, we see that very often. I mean, we have uh, many cases in which something has not been done and the patient has to pay uh, a toll a uh, few years after the operation. For instance, uh, yesterday we had a patient with uh, endocarditis. Uh, and this patient had already implanted uh, uh, a TAVI uh, two and a half years ago. But the problem is that the patient had, first of all, a wolf parkinson white syndrome, and second, he had a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a gradient of 100. So, and the patient, the patient was implanted with a TAVI, came back two years later with an endocarditis of the TAVI. So, uh, I remember also one of our transplant cases in Barcelona years ago, and the patient got transplanted after alcohol septal ablation because he went immediately into cardiogenic shock and, and because of excess alcohol. And, and there are many others. Uh, so, I think that. The important thing, especially for the young people, is to understand that this is a surgical disease that has proven results for 60 years and uh, that the uh, results offered to the patients are extremely good, not only acutely, but also uh, in terms of resolution, uh, resolution of obstruction, which is probably the most important thing. And this is going to be absolute immediate and will last forever. And then we have, as Dr. Schaaf would definitely confirm, uh, more than 25 years follow up with, with this. So uh, other than that, I think that's uh, uh, been a, a tremendous session in which uh, personally, I, of course, I, I learned a lot. So thanks very much to everybody uh, for this opportunity. Does anyone else have any questions? I, there's, a, there's a few areas that we didn't uh, discuss the cases that I think if you wanted to take a few more minutes and discuss, do we have more time? Yeah, yeah, I, I had one comment linking to what Carlos said. Carlos, thank you. Your comments always very appropriate. And, and what you said about uh, other therapies links and brings us to novel therapeutic options like Mabacan Are you, you want comments on Mabacan? I, I'd be happy to, to make a comment on Mama uh, it is It has the possibility of being disappearmide mm. without the uh, side effects. It, it, it does, does essentially the same thing. Um, if, it, if it works, it may reduce the number of patients who come to surgery. But let me just tell you, give you a little background on Mama the company Myocardia, is everybody familiar with that company? Yep. Yeah. Myocardia was purchased by Bristol Myers Squibb for $13 billion. That's billion with a B. They have, they have one product. They may have others in the pipeline. I'm not saying that, that there's not more to it than that. But the only product that they have that's ready for clinical trials is Mavicantin. Now, I don't have any question how the trial is going to turn out. If you spent $13 billion to get this drug, you, you know there's going to be some positive effect somewhere. 
but that drug will be so expensive. I don't see how they're going to get their money back. And when I spoke to I spoke to somebody who was investing, an investment person from New York, they were calling about trying to find out how this would impact surgery. I said, if it works, it'll take quite a number of surgical patients away. I said, but how much are they planning to charge for it? And they were planning to charge something on the neighborhood that would run about $30,000 a year. Now, I don't, I don't know about you, but that the healthcare system won't pay $30,000 a year for this. I said, well, in two years, surgery is more cost effective. Now, I don't know how they're eventually going to price it, but remember, they have to make up $13 billion or a large chunk of that if that drug turns out to be uh, positive. So yes, it may, it may impact practice a bit, but I don't think it's going to take surgery away. At least that, that's, that's my view. We'll, we'll, we'll see in the next five years. Now that, that's a great thing about cardiovascular disease is you don't have to wait a whole generation. You'll figure, you know, we'll figure it out in, in five years or so. But, um, the other thing I, I wanted to bring up and, and open for discussion and others can jump in on this too, that you, uh, Robert, very carefully mentioned the obstruction is common, but about half of the patients with obstruction will have what we call latent obstruction. And I, I, we still see patients from time to time that are referred late because somebody thinks that latent obstruction is not as severe as resting obstruction. In other words, a patient can, if they have a 20 millimeter gradient at rest and they get severe symptoms and you have a provoked gradient of 80, that patient does just as well with surgery as somebody who has a resting gradient. And very too many clinicians feel like there, it's not time yet for surgery if they don't have resting obstruction. And I don't know how cardiologists are uh, you know, at, at your institution, but it's that's something to look out for. And when you're talking to them about that, emphasize the fact that these patients with latent obstruction are just as, can be just as symptomatic. You can't separate out their symptoms from patients with fixed obstruction. Um, we didn't talk about the, the business that you brought up the, the alcohol septal ablation. That's a whole another can of worms, but when, when we look at our experience and compare outcome of surgery with septal ablation, one of our residents did a nice little study on this. Her name was Anita Nguyen, and she published a paper in the, in the journal looking at the outcome of surgery versus alcohol septal ablation. And there were about 1,400 patients in the study. And then when we submitted it, we did, we did matching, propensity matching, propensity score matching and so forth. When we submit it, and that's because our patients that get alcohol septal ablation are a little bit older. There's some of them are sicker and not fit for surgery and so forth. So you have to adjust for the fact that there's selection. And when we submitted the paper, but it, it also showed that surgical patients had better functional recovery, better relief of gradients and fewer re-interventions. No question that surgery gave better mm -hmm. results. But when we looked at survival, once you look at if you looked at survival of patients that had alcohol septal ablation and survival of surgical patients, and then you adjusted the curves, the difference narrowed. And the, the statistical editor, and I won't tell you which one it was because it will bias you, but the statistical editor told us we had to use propensity matching. I don't want to get down in the weeds on the statistics of it, but with propensity matching, the p-value was like point two or 0.12 or something. The p-value was not 0.05. That was the difference. There was a difference in, in outcome of patients with surgery and those that had alcohol septal ablation. The hazard ratio was 1.5. Now what a hazard ratio of 1.5 means is there, if you have surgery, there's a 50% improvement in survival. And if that had been a beta blocker in a heart failure trial, it would be headlines that you can reduce mortality by 50%. This one was said not to be statistically significant and they wouldn't let us say any more about survival. When we use the same patients in, and use inverse probability weighting, 
or multivariable adjustment, guess what? The hazard ratio is 1.5 and the p-value is 0.002. So in, in our, it, it is our belief that there is an advantage with surgery, but the reason what, what you get with propensity matching is you cut out a bunch of patients. So when you match patients, instead of having 1,400 patients, we had 500 and something patients that were matched. Now we're doing a, a, a study and I'm not gonna spill all the beans, but we're doing a study with a multi-center study with a, a, another center here that's busy in the United States, a center from China that's busy looking at the outcome of, of septal myectomy and alcohol septal ablation. And, and I think, I'm not gonna, uh, we don't have all the results in, but I think this will establish that there is a significant difference in survival. Now, I, I recognize this may not change practice in Europe, but I, I think it'll give surgeons some ammunition when you sit down and you talk with the cardiologist about whether a patient ought to have uh, one method of septal reduction or the other. Does anybody have any comments on comparisons of the two? Well, I think if I may, um, <clears throat> when, when you, Surf in the literature, uh, at least uh, until a couple of years ago or three years ago, when we had a look at that, it is very clear in terms of this uh, survival functional capacity, life expectancy. It is very clear that uh, there's no no one can still compete with uh, surgical myectomy. I mean, we have these data available, 25, 30 years follow up. Uh, uh, no physical limitation, normal lifestyle. Uh, uh, more than ninety percent of patients they they, they have uh, an absolutely normal living and functional capacity more than ten years after myectomy. And when you compare that with with every single cardiology paper, the median follow up is very short. There's uh, quite a bit of missing data. Uh, uh, at least ten fifteen percent, if not more, they 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 need a redo settle reduction therapy and so on. So I think at the moment with the information which has been accumulated over time, uh, uh, it is very clear uh, for the dummy like me, for the normal people that uh, we should not hesitate to uh, continue spreading the word and, and creating more and more awareness because this is something that really uh, makes the patients much better with minimal morbidity acutely and of course uh, on the, on the follow-up. And just, just to follow up on that point, if, if you look at what we were doing surgically 20 years ago or 30 years ago, or even the, the operation that Glenn Morrow did, you could get rid of subaortic obstruction. But if you take the second patient that you just presented to us, at, at mm -hmm. Edward, or was it the second or third patient, the one that had the, the systolic cavity obliteration? Yeah, third one. You, I, I can yeah if you take that patient and just do a subaortic myectomy, that patient is likely to have symptoms afterwards related to the crowding of the distal ventricle. So I think we as surgeons understand much more about what needs to be done now for, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy surgically. So I, I would hope that you know, the improved functional outcome of surgery will, will become evident uh, in the future as well. The, the last thing we, we haven't talked about and we can spend a little time on is surgery for non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and, and this is something that's not been you know, widely accepted, but we see a lot of patients at Mayo Clinic who are referred and are candidates for that. They, they vary from true apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to patients like yours who had a very crowded looking ventricle and what we call systolic cavity obliteration. Now, the systolic cavity obliteration is an interesting group and we've, we've probably done a couple dozen patients like that, but they have some interesting characteristics. These are patients who, who have a relatively small and fixed stroke volume. And it's very common when you ask them what their symptoms are, they're doing fine at rest, but anytime they exercise, their heart rate goes to 140 because they're trying to improve their cardiac output by increasing their heart rate. And if these patients are placed on a beta blocker, guess what? They feel even worse. 
because they can't increase their cardiac output. I mean, beta blockers mm -hmm. don't do much for diastolic heart failure. It, it can slow the heart down and it can maybe decrease inducible gradients. But in patients with apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or this phenomenon of systolic cavity obliteration is a mechanical problem, or at least there's a mechanical component to it. And so we do, we would accept patients for surgery if they're symptomatic, and these are all class three or class four patients. They're not, we don't do this in patients with minimal symptoms, but if they have advanced symptoms and have a small ventricle, and we, we can talk about what small means, but if they have a small ventricle because of apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or this cavity obliteration, we'll do the apical myectomy just as you illustrated um, to enlarge the cavity, mainly by taking muscle from the septum, but you can also shave the papillary muscles in some cases, but you take muscle mainly from the septum and the anterior wall and you increase the stroke volume. And these, some of these patients will get uh, you know, substantial improvement. And because for most of them, the alternative is a heart transplant. Uh, this is really a good option. So we would encourage most of these patients, and it's relatively safe to have this operation before going forward with a heart transplant. So if you if you see a patient like that, that you're if somebody asks you to do a heart transplant and somebody with it, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, be sure and look at the echo in the MR and decide, is this patient maybe a candidate for one of these ventricular enlargement procedures? Uh, I think, Herschel, uh, I think Herschel, that you are completely right. Uh, at least in this part, in this side of the Atlantic, the problem is that the, the, goal, uh, the gatekeepers, they don't even think about it. About five weeks ago, there was one of these periodical inter-hospital discussions here, case presentations, and it was on which patients uh, here and then participating five, six hospitals. And then someone came with a case like that, and which you have described. And then I raised the, from another hospital. And then I... I, I told the cardiology, so does anybody think about uh, uh, going for this uh, uh, combined approach or optical resection, combined resection, because the patient had uh, uh, systolic uh, obliteration. And then uh, even uh, senior guys were very surprised that someone came with this idea. So listen, guys, this has been around for a while. Not everybody does it, but uh, before considering transplantation in some of this pathology, I would definitely try to, to look after something else. That's, that's uh, a, another problem that it's related to one of your prior comments on, on uh, the willingness or the awareness of the people to uh, look in different ways at this uh, complex uh, uh, group of uh, diseases. Right, and the, that's exactly right. And the, 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 a lot of patients will come in the door through the heart failure cardiologist who, who are not necessarily the, the Holcomb cardiologist in terms mm -hmm. of thinking about whether they might be candidates for something less than a transplant. Does anyone else have any experience with that or have seen patients like that? Well, they're out there. <laughs> <laughs> I have one comment, if I may go back to, to obstruction in uh, patients. And if we make the comparison on the mitral uh, repair business for the degenerative disease, which is a super safe operation with uh, near zero, I'm not going to say zero, but near zero mortality. And everybody has accepted to move towards the symptomatic patients because we know it, it works on the long run, the mitral repair business. Are, are we moving towards this? A path also in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, where in centers with large experience, we are offering already uh, myectomy to patients that are less symptomatic, class two, but maybe not yet jumping to the truly asymptomatic patient, despite they have severe obstruction, severe uh, secondary uh, MR. Um, you think that's going to get to us soon? Well, I don't, I don't know. It, it's a good question. It, it's, it, it, certainly the threshold for surgery, at least at our place, is lower. And I, I think the other thing that's, that's changed is that the cardiologist here introduced septal reduction therapy early in the conversation when the first time they see the patient, even if they're minimally symptomatic. 
I think what we would have to do is demonstrate that that there is either a survival or a functional benefit or a benefit in, in preventing atrial fibrillation by operating early. So I think that's that may be the key, looking at the left atrial size and saying maybe that should, should be a trigger. Because many, many times we see patients that come on their 65, 70, they are already a little bit older and cardiologists uh, think that uh, they may be already too old to, to go for surgery. This, we, we face that. In fact, we, we looked at this data here in Barcelona and in the last four or five years, Robert is looking into that. And I think we've done more than 50 patients that are beyond 65 years of age. Sometimes we find a lot of reluctance from the cardiologist side to send these patients with the argument <laughs> that these are high risk operations. And we, we, we barely saw any mortality on this uh, cohort of patients that usually need cabbage, uh, mitral valve uh, procedures, uh, aortic valve, sometimes aorta, atrial fibrillation. The outcomes are excellent and they return to normal lives. So I think that's, that's another message to send out there that I don't see any age limit really for a patient if the patient is fit to undergo, let's say an aortic valve replacement or a mitral valve replacement. If you would do that operation, why not a myectomy? Would, would you agree well, with that? I, I agree with that in a sense. I, the, other, the other point I'd make, and, and this is, is a really interesting point, um, these, the symptomatic patients, forget the asymptomatic patients, but yeah. the symptomatic patients are some of the most appreciative patients that I've encountered <laughs> in my professional career because they're, they're generally at a stage in life where they do want to be active. There are some 70-year-olds that have it, but then there's a lot of 40 and 50-year-olds who can't do anything. And when you relieve their obstruction and are back to normal, they are trem tremendously grateful. And when you do a few of those cases and those patients get back to their cardiologist and tell their cardiologist how happy they are that they were referred for surgery, you're, you're gonna get more cases. It's, yeah. it's a very gratifying procedure. You know, when we talk about how good we are with mitral valve repairs and we're operating on asymptomatic patients, we're not making them feel much better. Uh, but these, these patients are feeling great. So, you know, just stick with it. And if you, you know, if you're operating on the highly symptomatic patients, remember <clears> that may be advertisement for you if you get a good result, because they are in large part, very, very grateful. Also is not only one of the most rewarding operations, but one of the cheapest operations we have. That's right. No prostheses. <laughs> I think we could be talking here until tomorrow morning. Yeah. Well, listen, I appreciate you all having me. And I also appreciate you having this in English rather than in Espanol. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Uh, okay. Yeah, actually try to include everybody. We have a lot of international members now as well and people visiting uh, this meeting. So we prefer to speak in English. So I think if we, as Edward meant, we could speak here for hours and hours uh, in Europe. It's already like midnight. So I think if there are no the comments anymore. 1.30 a.m., Mateo, 1.30 a.m. Oh, yeah. I hope you don't have to do a myectomy tomorrow. <laughs> no, no, but we have to <laughs> sit tomorrow. <laughs> okay, well, anyways. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Schaff. Uh, thank you, Robert, and thank you, Edward, for the presentation. It was a pleasure. It was an honor. Very happy to have you all. And thank you, all the persons in the public, for joining us today. Yeah, we'll see you next just, time. Just, just a quick you. reminder, Mateo. Just we hope all this COVID thing gets away and finally you can come here this year in Barcelona so we can all join together for the EX meeting and, uh, you know, both societies mm -hmm. uh, grew up together. Great. True. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye, Harrison. I'll see you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.